This episode is sponsored by Kendo UI. Kendo UI allows you to build better apps faster. They have a comprehensive library ranging from data grids and charts to buttons and sliders. Plus, you can use their components as plain JavaScript as well as in Angular, React, and Vue. They have a large collection of customizable popular themes like Bootstrap and Material. Go check them out at javascriptjabber.com slash kendo UI. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of JavaScript Jabber. This week on our panel, we have AJ O'Neill. Yo, 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 coming at you live next to a train station in Provo. Oh, are you in the startup building? I am. I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv. I just identified the co-working space that I used to go to periodically. So for those who aren't aware or familiar with Provo, Utah, uh, we have a special guest today, and that is uh, Kurt. And I, for some reason, it won't pull up the info. So Kurt Mackey. That's me. From Fly.io. Yeah, thanks for having me. Fly.io. We're building a uh, programmable CDN. It's the quickest description I have of what we're doing. Nice. Um, now, I'm glad that you said that because I was wondering. I read the first sentence on the page here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the uh, so if you see the word edge, that's for investors. Uh, and if you talk to me, it's a lot more API and JavaScripty sounding because it's for developers. So no, I, I understand. Microsoft has made the word edge really cool, and I actually like it. So I just cut you off, Chuck. No, it's fine. It's just it says uh, on the um, on the calendar invite, building a JavaScript platform that gives you the power to build your own CDN. That's yes, that's the longer one. That is accurate. So do you want to just kind of talk through some of these details, kind of give us a uh, high-level overview of what we're really digging into? Yeah, um, sure. And I can give you a fair amount of history because this, this has been like 10 years of angry all, all coming together to make a company. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah, so the genesis of this is I used to work uh, on a site called Ars Technica um, at Condé Nast, and we had you know, millions and millions of visitors a day. We had content that that changed all the time. And we had these these interesting problems that I didn't feel like there was a lot of people helping us solve. And basically what happened is you go look at a really popular article. So like, I assume everyone uses Macs or most of you all do. But basically what happens is you, we post a review of like the, the latest Mac OS or latest MacBook Pro or something like that. And then there's this huge crushing of traffic and 99% of those people are anonymous and you can serve up the exact same content. The other 1% are actually customers and like valuable kind of valuable users that should be getting a more personalized experience. Um, and because we make money off of them and, and the, the really difficult thing was CDNs were really well equipped for static files and things that didn't change and really didn't do anything for anything, even like 1% dynamic, much less an actual application. And so and this is why I said 10 years of anger. We basically, I sat on this for since 2008. I remember I have, I actually have a really, really early version of what we're doing with Python and spider monkey on GitHub from 10 years ago. And um, basically the idea was like, well, why don't we let people extend their application logic to what's now the edge. But at the time we just called a CDN. So a CDN, the way we think about it is a CDNs are the first real practical application of an edge. And they handle static caching and and like DDoS and some other things really well. And what we're trying to do is is basically turn that into a set of APIs where you can build CDNs that do exactly what you want or build things that we've never even dreamed of, which is what's happening most often. So this kind of sounds like you're putting some of the burden of your JavaScript nastiness onto the web server rather than a build environment or a uh, standalone API server. Yeah, that's that's reasonably accurate. And the way I think the best way to picture it is kind of like a if you imagine you have your browser or increasingly your like mobile application that runs the client side JavaScript, and you have your centralized server that probably has a schema and has some level of logic with it. The fly is, is, is the proxy layer, and it's another place to run JavaScript that just so happens to be close to users. I think that's the key point is we're trying to, we're trying to get things as close to end visitors and end app users as possible. 
because the speed of light actually <laughs> affects our working days, which is kind of a, it's fun to tell my parents that. They're like, really? That's strange. But the idea is run this as close to users as possible because we, we basically relieve them some of the burden of downloading all of this code that needs to execute. But also we're not adding extra latency by making someone in like Utah, for example, have to go hit a server that's in New York. So I'm, I'm not sure if I completely understand what we're looking at here. So essentially, let me see if I can recap some of this. Because when I think of a CDN, I'm thinking, okay, I put like static files up. Yep. And then there's some caching layer in the middle, yep. right? And it, it decides how long it holds it in that cache before it, you know, moves it off to less prioritized traffic places. Yep. So, you know, initially I thought, okay, well, then this must just be some API layer that lets you determine your caching algorithm. Yes, um, it, but, it does that. So like, okay, so when you do, when you do a CDN, uh, and there's a couple of different ways, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna tell you like from CDN up first, and I'm gonna give you some examples I think might be useful. The, um, so when you, when you have a CDN cache your, like say podcasts, you, you send the file to the CDN with some, usually it's over HTTP with some headers that tell them how long to cache it, when to get rid of it, what to vary by and all that. So there's some, some, a little bit of declarative logic in there that lets them determine how best to keep it, when it needs to be refreshed. And then ultimately if there's a problem, it just goes away and they go get a new copy of it. Um, Fly, like in its basic example, what it actually does is it flips that around. And so you write some JavaScript to determine how you want things cached. So there is a cache API in there. You can say, I have this chunk of data and maybe it's a file I've pulled in, or maybe it's just like, uh, like a view partial. And I want to cache this for an hour and I want this specific set of variants and I want to do a different one per user I have. So at that level, it's, you can think of it in some ways as a, as if you're expressing all of your caching logic in JavaScript instead of by clicking buttons or using HTTP headers, that's a good start. Um, the other interesting way to think about it is, is um, I'm not, are you all familiar with Lighthouse, the Google performance report engine that you use I've against applications? I've played with it a little bit. Okay. Um, Lighthouse is, is kind of, so we just talked about CDN a little bit, which I think of as more of like a bottoms up how you get to a platform. I think Lighthouse is a good way to go a little top down. And what, what CDNs have historically done is, helps you optimize things like time to first byte. So when I start making a request, I want it to take 30 milliseconds before, less than 30 milliseconds for my CDN to start sending data back, which is actually a good system level metric, but it's not kind of meaningless to a business. What Lighthouse does is it tries to take performance of an application and, and give you a score that's supposed to match human perception. And the theory is that if you make your app faster, you make more money. And there's been lots of large companies that have sort of proven us out, at least for their models. And so what Lighthouse is, is it's the, it's the holistic, this is our performance score, whereas what CDNs tend to focus on is time to first byte. And um, so one of the ways we're applying Fly is we're actually, we're actually seeing people write logic to improve their Lighthouse score. And one of the ways they do that is they get cache data close to users. But another way they do this is they actually do things like resize and optimize images. Uh, I'm going to say this way too much on the fly before they send them to users to to give them like WebP if they can handle WebP or to give them to to like inline or I'm sorry inject um, responsive image markup which is actually difficult. And so the basically a lot of how we're seeing this applied is to write some code to improve your lighthouse scores on top of the plumbing that helps include, improve the time to first byte. It seems like you might be able to then hook this up to a service that does resize the image, or maybe it's already built into something like Fly. I'm kind of curious, have you built this in, or is this something else that people are doing? Oh, resizing images? Yeah. Yeah, there's, a, there's actually an API for that. Um, so it's pretty easy to like load up an image from a URL to, to do things like size it down, convert it to WebP, change the compression, or, or even do interesting things. One of the really interesting things I saw someone do is they, what they do is they serve, they have like, um, sort of like you imagine stock images on a stock photo site. So they have all these images that when they show on their site, they want them to look clean and unencumbered. But if it's, if it's embedded in another site and they don't get the right referrer data, they actually want to watermark it with their logo. So that's one of the ways you could use our image API to add a little bit of logic to that layer and never hits their servers. They don't ever get, they don't ever, you know, have to 
get handle a ton of load when that happens exactly that's sort of our problem that's interesting so it sounds though like you were saying that there's some level of execution that's closer to the the user now is that is that what we're talking about here is just managing these assets that runs closer to the the user or is there some other aspect like can you modify your own javascript files or things like that that people get yeah um so basically when you deploy a fly app we push it all over the world and when your users connect to your fly app which frequently is ser serving a sort of proxy service they connect to the one that's closest to them um so i hit a server in chicago because i'm in chicago and then all the all the processing that app's doing is actually happening like eight miles away from my house to 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 um to help with the latency basically so that when it does do things like modify the images it's actually doing that very close to me it's not having to go back to virginia or san jose to do that stuff so the i think the the trick for what cdms did really well is they got static content close to users but we're trying to do really well is get more like more logic more more application logic in those same spots um, because you can do things like watermark images that you wouldn't necessarily want to tackle that all in one spot and you can't do that client side because you've already kind of lost that logic so are you saying with the resizing images and that kind of stuff you're looking at the user agent string and then saying here's some logic for a user agent string like this to give them webp instead of giving them mp4 or something like that yeah that's uh that's a part of it so browsers helpfully send the the accepting or the accept header um which will tell you if, if they can handle WebP or not. It's a little more tricky than that because some of them sort of half lie about this, but. Like uh, iOS? <laughs> yeah, like older, older Safaris. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting problem. For, it's actually gotten a lot better. You can pretty much count on that accept header for WebP yeah, totally. now. Okay. Uh, so we'll do that. Uh, we'll also do things like um, you, can, you actually have access to, the, to like a DOM within the proxy. So one of the interesting things we've seen people do is is a lot of people use like third party hosted services for things like blogging. So the ghost blog, I'm not sure. I, I assume you guys have heard of ghost, the blogging engine. That's yeah. It's like Jekyll. Yeah. yeah. In, yeah. Node? in node. Yeah. Um, and it's, 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 they have a hosted service. It's super convenient to turn on. The problem is, is they don't give you much control over things like how the pages are rendered with that hosting service. So we've had people that build a fly app to intercept the HTML that ghost sends you to do some DOM manipulations on it um, and insert things like the responsive image markup and then send it along to the user. That's interesting. I, I really like the sound of this. Like I've thought about this. I don't even know all of the use cases that could pertain to it, but I just really like the idea of more of this, um, you know, like, like with a C program, if I compile my C program, the compiler decides, you know, how to get it right for the target. And I think yep. in JavaScript, I've always wanted to see something where it's more the web server being intelligent and saying, well, here's my source files. I'm going to compile it correctly for the target rather than that being in build tools. And that sounds like what you're doing, which is so cool. Yeah, I think that's actually a really good take. Um, we've, we've doing, we're doing some, um, we're helping a couple larger companies with big projects. And one of the, one of the more extreme and I think really interesting ones is is um, doing a little bit. I, I keep referencing other projects, but um, if you're aware of Gatsby, Gatsby is also mm -hmm. like Jekyll Static Site Generator uses yep. React. It does this really amazing thing where um, it pre-renders each page as HTML with things like inline CSS and all the CSS that page needs, and then it it loads the actual React components asynchronously as JavaScript. And then when you click, it's actually, it's a hydrated React app. So it's not loading the full next page, it's just pulling down the JSON it needs to, to basically modify the state and show you what you need. Um, and so that's one of the things we, we're, we're helping a customer apply on the edge is basically React app or like React components that get pre-rendered into HTML. They get the embedded CSS, because basically if you have the components, you know which bits of CSS you need to to inline in the page and then kind of intelligently loading the rest of the client JavaScript after that first page is down. Uh, and it's a, that C example is a really good one. It's like we kind of know what the users want. We know um, a little bit about their browser and we, we at least know how we can structure HTML that they can read and do smart things with. And, and the back end developers don't necessarily have to think about that and shouldn't in some large organizations. 
So I, I can kind of get an idea of what this is capable of. One thing that I'm wondering is, is and, and this is kind of comes out in the title that you gave us, was, uh, you know, building an, an, a platform for this kind of CDN offering. So how do you build? I mean, is it just node close to you or... <laughs> Uh, you know, is yeah. it, you know, is is there more to it than that? And and why is it referencing V eight V eight V eight and it never says Node specifically? Um, because when you actually deploy a fly app, what what you're doing is not running Node. You're running. We have a basically a custom runtime built on top of V eight, uh, and there's a lot of intricate inside baseball type details about why. But the idea is that imagine so like right now we have servers in sixteen cities. Uh, you're probably not going to want to pay to run a node process on every server we have and have it fresh. So we kind of get into this world of serverless type problems. And and most serverless things that run node have a warm up time with functions. It takes like, you know, it might take, well, every time you boot a node process, you can basically watch how long it takes to get started, which is completely terrible for anything servicing these kind of requests. And so what we ended up doing was building a, a JavaScript I keep saying runtime. V8 is the runtime, but we built a JavaScript platform on top of V8 with our own APIs exposed into it. And the idea is when we have a connection from an end user coming in, we actually get people into their custom JavaScript in less than a millisecond, whether we have a process warmed up or not. And it's there and it's ready to go. And so it's actually, it sounds, I don't know if it sounds simple, that having to do all of this was much more difficult than we expected it to be because we have slightly different constraints trying to run these applications all over the world than, than like Lambda has just trying to run node apps. Um, and then the flip side of that is if you're, running an, if you're running an application that's sort of location agnostic, and the idea is that like in a browser, you have local storage on, with node on, even on Lambda, you have probably like a Postgres database you can read and write from. If you're running on this proxy layer that could be at any city in the world, you have different problems with, for data than you would otherwise. You can't connect to your Postgres server that's in, in Virginia. You can't, you can't go use a, a Redis because even like you won't be able to maintain a connection between them. And so um, we've actually ended up exposing a lot of browser-like APIs to people because the browsers tend to have a, a less stateful, like a, a more stateless API setup that works pretty well for this sort of thing. So yes, we say V8 a lot because we don't we we haven't we don't give people Node. We actually give them a custom JavaScript runtime that's modeled after the browser. So what's all this about bajillions of NPM modules then? Oh, what did I say here? Where did I say bajillions of NPMs? Is that on the homepage or did I put that in a little thing? Modern JavaScript, right? Modern JavaScript. Oh, there it is. Yes. All right. So since it is JavaScript, there are actually a ton of you can run almost anything that's pure JavaScript in there. Um, you can, you can, we have a, when you download our CLI, uh, and it's open source, you can go poke around the source and see it. It's actually the open source one is, is going to get really, really, um, turtles all the way down here. The open source CLI is a node app that creates the V8 environment for us, um, and does things like packages right now we're using Webpack. It packages MPMs into a, into basically a V8 snapshot that we can then run. So you can use a lot of existing JavaScript libraries. Um, you can't use like the node file system module, but you can use a lot of stuff that's targeted at the browser and anything that would use in, you know, in, in any JavaScript build system, you can actually try and it becomes obvious pretty quickly whether it's working or not. I did say bajillions, that's a good word. I wrote that a long time ago, I forgot about that. My favorite, <laughs> my favorite numbers are, 11th, <laughs> 11th, and this one might not always be PC, depending on where you're at, but a Brazilian. A Brazilian. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was in a movie or something. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> or a Googleplex or Google. I don't, yeah, I try to explain to my kids how Google is actually a mathematical concept, not just a, a, a thing <laughs> on the internet. And they didn't, they're like, no, it's not. That's not right. Yeah, Search good luck with that. First, <laughs> uh, my my question is: uh, you mentioned anything that's pure JavaScript, you can probably run on there. So you can write your own functions. You can yep. run anything that relies on an NPM module that's completely JavaScript. What about stuff that's not? You know, it relies on some third party uh, C compiled library or right. something like that. Um, that's so. That's 
that's a big limitation we have. You can't, this is going to, right now you can't. Um, we're actually experimenting with a lot of WebAssembly because you can, like we compiled OpenSSL to WebAssembly, which you would never want to do, but it, you can do it. Um, and so WebAssembly doesn't really, it doesn't really do threading or concurrency or any of that stuff, but you can actually compile a lot of native modules to WebAssembly. So our general plan is that's the path for solving people that need more native module speed. Um, there are a lot of, we have had some success with letting people, so we're actually quick to expose native modules into the runtime because I think that's, it's a, it's kind of better for us to do that. Um, than necessarily let people build a bigger JavaScript environment that takes longer to even accept a request. But you can't just grab a random, I'm trying to think of a good, a good example of a package that has a native module and I'm coming up blank. But that is a, this is a good limitation. Any pure JavaScript is good. You can't use the native modules. Um, we've had some people use, they'll do things like run Lambda for kind of fat functions and and put a fly up in front to sort of manage the Lambda state and manage the responses you send back to users. But What's the, a fat function? Uh, I'm a, sorry, fat function, I would just call it, a, it's, a, it's a kind of a full node function. It's a thing with, with, with access to like the node native modules and things. This, this is my word, it's not, a, it's not a standard word. But the idea is like, uh, oh, here's a good example. I mentioned the Lighthouse scores earlier. There's a Lighthouse node module that runs the headless Chrome. Um, to do this di these diagnostics on an app, um, and we actually we have actually we actually have a, a a lambda function that will run the the node stuff on demand when we need a report, um, and then our edge app will just hold the connection open and wait for that to finish, and then ultimately show the results to the users, um, and then we'll write those to S3 and go get back, go get them later as well. But anyway, that's a good, that's a, it's a accurate limitation. Like one of the big limitations we have since we let you run the app all over the world is you also can't use native node modules. Yeah. But if you're delegating out to a Lambda, doesn't that kind of defeat the purpose of what you're doing? Because then you have to send off to another system that may not be close by to somebody and on and on and on. Right. Right. So the, for something it, it would, if you were delegating for something that needs to happen fast, but Lighthouse reports take like 60 seconds to run. It's already a slow operation. And there's really, there's some things that are so slow, there's not a huge amount of benefit of getting them close to users. So I would oh, say- Oh, I got gotcha. you. Like end runs to the database and things like that may not be very fast. Right, um, right. So you might think about it as more like an asynchronous job we're running where we manage the state of that with the edge app, but the actual rendering and responses to users are fast still. This is really, really interesting. Yeah, this is a, it's been a real interesting. Um, I've never built a developer platform before, so it's a, and you can probably <laughs> sense it, but it's, it's fun to, um, it's actually really fun to have something that's so hopelessly generic that it's like, well, you can do a lot of stuff with it. And here's the really valuable things we've seen people do. But it's also like, I don't, I, I fully expect someone's going to just shock me to death in six months with what they've chosen to build on this thing that I'm like, oh, yeah, cool. Why don't you go ahead and tell people that? So they'll do it too. That'd be awesome. I'm still not quite sure why you can't have some warmed up version of Node that will just run whatever people want instead of having something that spins up fast. Well, so if you can, um, but then that's the locality problem. So even, and we wanted something, I'm a developer and we really like developers and we really wanted something that was accessible to them. So like the reason actually, so, um, uh, Google has their Spanner service that you can go buy through Google Cloud. Um, this is this is pretty databasey, but Spanner runs a database all over the world for you. You literally can't use Spanner for less than like three thousand dollars a month. It's not even accessible because mm -hmm. it's just it's expensive to run that many processes, that much memory all over the place. So the, our big reason for wanting to do it this way is so we could actually give developers kind of what big companies have been buying from Akamai for so long. So like even. Even 10 years ago, if you had the money, you could have gone to Akamai and spun up JavaScript applications, or I'm sorry, Java application servers all over the world, but you'd have been paying them $50,000 a month to do this. Right. And so the, the process is fine uh, if you don't care about locality, the, the, but the process has quickly become really expensive if you're, if you're running them in even the 15, 16 data centers that we do right now. This episode is sponsored by Sentry.io. Recently, I came across a great tool for tracking and monitoring problems in my apps. Then I asked them if they wanted to sponsor the show and allow me to share my experience with you. Sentry provides a terrific interface for keeping track of what's going on with my app. 
It also tracks releases so I can tell if what I deployed makes things better or worse. They give full stack traces and as much information as possible about the situation when the error occurred to help you track down the errors. Plus, one thing I love, you can customize the context provided by Sentry. So, if you're looking for specific information about the request, you can provide it. It automatically scrubs passwords and secure information, and you can customize the scrubbing as well. Finally, it has a user feedback system built in that you can use to get information from your users. Oh, and I also love that they support open source to the point where they actually open source Sentry if you want to self-host it. Use the code DEVCHAT at Sentry.io to get two months free on Sentry's small plan. That's code DEVCHAT at Sentry.io. That, that makes a lot of sense. So is this something that's live, that's out there for people to go bang on right now? Or does it, it have a beta tag on it? Or what, what um, are we looking at here? No, it's, we've, got, we've got several companies using it in anger. Uh, we have a, <laughs> nice. we have, there, there's one, we'll do some case studies about this, but we have one, um, one large public company that's basically revamped a lot of their site underneath this specifically in, in, in search of better lighthouse scores, because, um, Google cares about this and they want their search traffic to be good and they serve ads and they want their ad compressions to be good. Um, so it's out there. And like I said, it's open source. You can actually, this is actually one of the, one of the things that we did, we launched this in April. So it's been almost two months now. Um, it feels like it's been forever. But one of the things that we heard from people when we were first talking to them is I, I finally learned to ask them like what sucks about their CDN because there's a lot of really good CDNs out there, but everybody, you know, there's stuff that they don't do well. And one of the more interesting bits of feedback I heard was like, I'm terrified that I can make a change through like some web portal that brings my whole site down because I can't test it. I can't easily roll stuff back. Um, and that's part of why we decided to make this run locally. So you can actually run any edge app locally. You can write tests against it. You can build a proper deploy process for, for um, you know, just like you would with any kind of continuous integration. So even if you just want to use this as a CDN, it's actually a really interesting, I think, way of deploying CDN changes, even if you're not getting much out of JavaScript itself. Oh, and we have a free credit. So if you do run it locally and you want to deploy it for everyone to see, you can just deploy it. And there's no, wouldn't even ask for a credit card right now. So if you're not asking for credit cards, how do you make money? Or do you just run out of credit eventually? Oh, you run out of credit and ask for a credit card. And but there's no like, we don't necessarily expect you to give us money up front. It's a lot of show. We're trying to just prove to people that it works really well right now. And that makes sense. So we're talking about JavaScript here. What about other languages or even just compiled to JavaScript systems like TypeScript and stuff? Yeah, um, we actually build most of our stuff in TypeScript because I love types and we love types. And if you're, if you're exposing APIs to people, types are amazing. Um, so we, you can actually compile one of the more interesting demos we've done uses it basically. And this is, we're just taking advantage of Webpack for a lot of this but you can compile JSX or anything else into your Webpack bundle and it just works. Um, we, you, can, you can actually use loaders for things like, like raw text files for Markdown for anything like that if you want. Um, I'm actually, I've been really astonished because I've used JavaScript for a really long time, but I've never used exclusively JavaScript for very long, but I'm, I'm actually pretty blown away by how, how big JavaScript is, like how much penetration it has, how many developers there are. It's, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, we, we we love JavaScript here too. So I would hope. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think I made the mistake at a meetup of saying something like, "I know JavaScript isn't everyone's favorite language," and all these people were like, "Yeah, it is. That's why we're at this meetup. It's my favorite." Like, you, why did you say that? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not everybody's, but it is a lot of people's. Yes, I think the the more intelligent point I should have made is just that. Even people who don't love JavaScript, like a lot of them use it anyway because it's just so mm -hmm. it's so ubiquitous. Yeah, it's true. Well, and you know, I, I still like I'm working on a system for podcasters and I'm building it in Ruby on Rails. And yep. you know, it it you just kind of go with what you know, what you like, what you're used to, and or what you have to. <laughs> or what you have to, yes. Which, which is why there's like, instead of there being just one JavaScript, there's like 15 of them. Yes. There's TypeScript, mm -hmm. and there's Babel, and there's da 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 Elm, and Elk, and Elm. Reason ML, that's what's fascinating me. Yeah. Right. So, so as long as you can compile it to JavaScript, then you can run it on fly. Yes. 
Um, and since we are VA, you actually get a pretty modern JavaScript, so async and await and all that stuff just work, which is really cool. Yeah, that, I guess that's another thing to bring up is, so you're just running off of the V8 engine, whatever it is? Yep. Um, because I've, I've seen systems, uh, for example, Lambda for the longest time was on Node 4. Yes. I mean, they've updated it now. I think it's Node 8 or 10. 8.1 8. or 8.10, whatever it is, I think, yeah. But but yeah, it was like, it was like really? So I'm right. like going through and how do I do this? You know, because I, I don't use Node all the time. Right. And so I was trying to write a Lambda function and I'm like, okay, how do I do this? And I kept getting like the Node 6 and Node 8 versions of how to do it and it wouldn't work. And so finally I had to, oh, okay. So I'd be typing in Node 4 and then pulling out six-year-old examples on how to do something. Yeah. The, um, yes. I don't know if you know why Lambda's like that. It's or, cool, but yeah, it's really slow to get new Node versions. Is that 4 or point four? Because those are distinctly different. Yeah, it was 4. Okay, because that wasn't that long ago, was it? No, but it was different enough from whatever the current version was that I couldn't just pull examples of node code off of the web. Hey, I had to actually. That's blowing my mind, actually. I wrote a bunch of node in 2011, 2000, 2011, 2013, I think, and then came back, and it's just mind-blowing how different JavaScript is over even five years. Yeah. Node, nodes like nodes keeping up, but it's like JavaScript's changed, nodes changed. Mm-hmm. Node eight seems old already. Yeah, the other pr- the other problem was npm packages. Not all of the npm packages played nice with whatever version. Of code. In the early days, that was especially true. I think version four is where that started to turn around, and the API got very stable. Yeah, like there's been there's I think the biggest change since version four has been buffer. And one thing I have to tangent rave about for a second. They finally fixed every TLS bug that I've ever opened. <laughs> So Node 10 actually has proper networking where you can pipe an unencrypted stream to an encrypted stream back to an unencrypted stream. Huzzah. Yeah. <laughs> and it was a real fix. It wasn't one of those we've migrated projects and just closed all the old issue things that happened so frequently. No, no because every version of Node, there was, I had the craziest, hackiest, nastiest workarounds you've ever seen where it would like, if you did one thing slightly wrong, it would drop down into a V8, like C error. Oh, wow. A, a core dump type error. Yep. That was in the TLS module, and they finally closed all of those. Anyway, didn't want to tangent too much on that, but I'm super excited about it. <laughs> yeah. Are, are there any th- other things about the technical specs on this that we should talk about before uh, we get into the business end of things? Because I want to talk about marketing to developers. Um, you know, the... No, I don't think so. I think that I've, I've had a lot of fun doing talks about embedding V8 and why you would want to, because I just, um, I think that's really cool. But there's not, I think we kind of covered pretty much everything that's all that important right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking for a tweet that I saw today. Um, I can probably scroll down far enough and find it. But the thing that was funny about it was it essentially said, uh, this is how developers view companies. And it, it was like, don't market to me, don't raise money, don't, <laughs> you know, don't sell anything, don't market to me, um, don't change, and don't shut down. Right? <laughs> Sounds accurate. And, so, and fix my bugs, that's the other. <laughs> yeah, and fix my freaking bugs for, for free, right? And so, it was, it, I was just laughing because I'm, you know, I, I see a lot of this. I mean, People generally will pay for training to upgrade their skills. Yeah. But when it comes to services and things like that, it's, I mean, people are funny about stuff. And a lot of the, like the monitoring tools and things like that, a lot of companies, they just kind of go, oh, we get it, right? It's going right. to show us our errors. Um, you know, your standard CDN, oh, it's going to make our website faster, you know, blah, blah, blah. But as soon as you add development features in there that aren't just like, here's our API, good luck. Yep. Um, developers get really funny about this stuff and some people some people are and some people aren't like i don't i don't want to make a sweeping generalization but yeah a lot of the people who complain about a lot of the companies out there they're compa- complaining about one of those things yeah and so I'm, I'm curious you know how do you put it out there and say hey we're gonna make your life better and we're gonna make you pay <laughs> right um that's actually really tough um so the last company was composed and we did hosted databases um and it was but we, it was much. I love Compose, bit, by the way. Oh, nice! I'm glad you know what it is. So yeah, that was uh, we sold it to IBM in 2015, and 
it was an easier sell there, sort of, because mm-hmm. people like there are developers get out of this, their their little world and they're like, yeah, I don't want to run a database. Yeah, like, exactly. Uh, it's like ah, I don't want to, I don't, eh, eh, don't want to, and they don't mind paying for that. Although we still got a lot of comp- they don't they don't necessarily recognize how expensive it is to do that either. But mm-hmm. um, in general, they seem okay paying for like op stuff and and monitoring because yeah. it's it's like eh, I don't really want to do that. Although now with AWS, and we still got even in that company, we got like, well, I could turn on a, you know, a medium EC2 instance for thirty five dollars a month, and that would be fine for my database. And it was it was kind of a funny. They also tend to think they can do everything, but um, for us, I think <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing because I totally get it, and I and part of me is laughing because I've dealt with people like that, and part of me is laughing because in some instances I am like that. And yeah, that's exactly. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm the worst not invented here person. <laughs> right. It's like, you got, like, yeah, you've got some serious competition, bro. <laughs> like a MongoDB. It's like, it's like, Oh, you know, app get install MongoDB. Oh, look, it's running. Right. Yes. And then the second I have to performance tune the thing or figure out why it's not behaving the way I want, even though I'm giving it the right query, it's like, frick, I'm out. Or restore a backup. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, that's job. Cool. somebody else. Right? Yeah. So the, I think the ops thing is a good example. Um, so one of the, I think one of the tricks is you have to do something that seems really difficult or expensive for people to do on their own. Mm-hmm. Uh, and like when we sold Compose and I quit to start another company, I had, we had, I had like 70 GitHub issues in a repository of things that I might want to work on. And one of them was infrastructure and everything else was not related partially for this reason. Cause there's a, what you're saying there's partially developers sort of mentality, but it's a little bit because the, you know, there's a lot, it's difficult to compete with AWS and it's really difficult to compete with even like Cloudflare and these giant companies that, that can ship your whole company as a feature in like two days and not charge anyone for it is a scary thing. Well, uh, except for whenever you're paying them, you're paying them like 10 times what you would pay if you, you know, had a dedicated server or something. Right, exactly. So, but like, so at some scale you can compete with AWS, but in general, like people aren't price sensitive that are buying from AWS. They're they're just buying from AWS because it's the new IBM. Um, so that was, I think part of it is like, you can deploy our apps globally and you don't think about it. It's not, it's not super accessible for a dev. They can deploy to multiple AWS regions and then figure out how to do load balancing and that all works. Um, so that works for them. But I think like some of it is just sort of ignoring the naysayers. Like I saw all these discussions yesterday about GitLab because GitHub bought, bought by Microsoft. So they're like, we'll move to this open core thing. And the people are like, well, it's just open core. They don't include things like, I don't remember the feature someone wanted. It's like, I, don't, I want that as valuable, but I don't want to pay for it is, is kind of the gist of their talk. So I love the people at GitLab, but their product is, there are better solutions. <laughs> I, I love GitLab. I, I will just put that right out there. It is I, great stuff. And I actually, have a community edition set up and that's where I host all my code. Uh, on, on what? Do you have a server with 64 gigs of RAM? Because as soon as you have more than one user, it's like... <sighs> I have it on a DigitalOcean instance and I think it's got 4 gig or 8 gig. I don't remember. Anyway. But yeah, Git, I mean, GitLab's interesting. I think they have an interesting business model. I'm a little cynical of open source business models. I think the whole open core thing makes a lot more sense to me. But... Um, because we've all watched the database companies open source their stuff and then try and figure out how to make money four years later when everyone was using it. Um, mm-hmm. Anyway, so I don't know. I think it's difficult. I think a lot of marketing to devs doesn't look like marketing, and it actually doesn't look a lot like... Um, you know what? Let me say something nice about devs, because we haven't. But one of the... <laughs> it's okay. We're honorary people and hard to deal with. We all know this. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? Also... And there's, I want to make a distinction between kind of student level devs that are just learning because I, I think that's immensely valuable. And I think like Glitch is amazing and any tool that you can use to learn to develop is really awesome. But developers that do it for a living are also really, they're really quick to put credit card information in if you can, if you could save them an hour. There's a, there's this point yeah. with devs where it's like you can charge sure. them 20 bucks a month and they'll pay you if, it, if it's, if you can save them an hour. And so I think one of the one of the tricks for us has been to come up with a way, and I mentioned free credits and stuff, is is to build something that works at that scale and solves your one hour problem, and then and then grow you into a larger customer. 
And that worked at Compose, and I'm hoping it works at Fly, but at Compose, about a third of the paid customers were actually like 85% of the revenue. Um, and then the other 15% was a little bit like, like if we were doing old at school enterprise sales, like leads. Um, but what actually worked really terribly was giving away any, any free service tier. That was awful. That was, that was, that never has worked for me. So interesting. There's a quote, um, Jeff Twilio CEO is named Jeff. I just blanked on his last name, but he actually, he made a really, and he had a really interesting quote about selling to developers where he said, developers are like consumers but with like the deep pockets of their companies behind them. So you, you end up marketing and talking to them as if you were doing a consumer product and then hoping it grows. Um, and anyway, I could talk for hours about how to actually market to devs in a way that won't make them vomit or won't make as many of them vomit. Um, but I think the the trick is just to, to be a dev and to talk like you're an honest person and, and not do a sales pitch. Well, it's interesting the way that you bring that up because, um, I mean, I do sponsorship sales, so I'm talking to marketing people a right. lot, right? And what you just said applies to a lot of people. Now, the marketing people, uh, their bs meter is, you know, it's, it's up there too because they kind of know how the game is played. Right. Um, you know, and, and it's the same kind of thing with developers. Um, you know, they're, they're just kind of like, are, you know, are you trying to sell me something or are you trying to help me out? Right. And, um, yeah, you know, so when I talk to the, the marketers, I think part of the reason why I'm able to sell sponsorships in some cases is because I'm not coming in with this sophisticated approach. I'm right. coming in with, you know what? I'm just a guy. I have a podcast or 10 and I want to <laughs> talk to you about supporting them. Right. And talk to you about how you can reach these people and see if you can help them out, yep. and 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 that works. And I think I think that's what you're saying is essentially it's just that authentic. You know what? I'm I'm not going to try and sales my way into your pocket because honestly, that's not what we do. Yep. Yeah, that's a. Um, I think it's a really good take. And actually, in fact, like most of our content and things, we're trying to. And this, it takes a lot of work, but basically we're trying to start structuring it as like, here's a problem you have. Here's, here's how you can solve it. And then here's how you can solve it. Like typically is with us, but it's also more generally applicable. I think then you can, you can take a lot of what we're marketing to people as our features and you could reapply them somewhere else with enough work or just go run our open source thing. And that seems to, that seems to work. Um, you know, I think the big difference between devs and marketers, and actually I, I think this is a sort of a, and salespeople and devs is I, I would guess the marketers are aware of it. And I know like salespeople are aware they're getting sold to, mm -hmm. but they're not, they, they sort of expect this. They're like, yeah, that's, that's how the world works. And I'm not angry yeah. that someone's trying to do this as much. No, as that's I'm very true. And I, I feel like devs are a lot of times not confident enough in their ability to negotiate or to say no, or to do any of these other things. And so you get a more visceral negative reaction from them than um you would otherwise yeah i, th I think that's somewhat fair um i all that um, said i like selling developers like i would much rather oh, build yeah. a dev focused company than anything else because it's it's like we can you, it's it's one of the few places i know where you can really just build and show it's like you can build something and show it to people and rinse and repeat that's true i think i think really that's the main difference is you know, you nailed it as far as, yeah, marketing people know that's kind of how the game is played. And so, Hey, you know, let's, you know, let's play, you know, right. let's talk through this and see how it works. And okay. What, what you're saying works sounds like it works. So let's, let's take a chance on it and they'll totally take a chance on it. Right. Um, but yeah, with, with developers, I, I also love your idea of just, yeah, let's just show you. Right. And if you can convince the developer that it's good for them, you know, that they're not going to be upset about it. But I think a lot of times too, we, we all kind of get pushed a little bit. You know, you go to a conference. It's funny. Every time I go to a conference, I come back with a, a bag full of swag. Right. <laughs> yep. And I wind up either given half of it, more than half of it. I wind up giving to my kids or throwing away. Yep. And it's, you know, you're trying to sell to me, you're trying to sell to me, you know, and even the people, you know, I go to a conference and they're like, you know, your .NET app. And I'm like, I've never written anything in .NET ever. And, right. you know, and they're like, oh, but you still need to buy. And, you know, and so that's kind of where people kind of get some of this is it's like, you know what, after a while, it's like, get off my back. 
and we get it from recruiters too. I mean, how many dev oh jobs gosh, are open yes. that they're just dying to fill? Right. And or how many meetups I, have you gone to where it's been like four recruiters or only people talking? That's the <laughs> yeah. And so uh, I, I think I think there's some of that too, and and it all kind of plays in. I think there's some cultural things that play into it too. Yep. So, yeah. You know, one um, one thing I distinctly remember from watching other companies while trying to do this is, um, and I'm gonna say the is there's also companies that it's almost a little condescending. So like when you or mm-hmm. I talk to developers, it's less condescending because we're there. But a lot of companies decide they're going to market to developers, and it's, it looks very much like marketing for toddlers, where they're addressing the developer but trying to sell something to their boss or to mm-hmm. some VP somewhere that is really did not. I, it's it's dishonest in, in some ways. It's really not legitimate. Um, and I think I have a I actually have a hugely adverse reaction to that. It's like don't I'm a dev. I'm not I'm not you know unversed in how to do businessy stuff. But generally I'm a dev, so I tend to get kind of irritated when people treat them like children in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've seen a fair a lot, what you mentioned at the conference is a lot of like that. Some of the really some of the, like the jokey shirts that just don't hit. Some of the things mm-hmm. where it's like. That's not valid syntax on that billboard. That's really irritating me. That's, that's my yeah. favorite one. <laughs> yeah. The other thing that I find is my nature as a developer, a lot of times I'm talking to somebody about something and after about three or four minutes, I'm looking at him and I just stop. Him. I'm like, okay, get to the point. <laughs> right. <laughs> right? <laughs> if you have to take this long to explain to me why I want it, I don't want it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or if I have to call you to buy it at all, I'm probably not going to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, like I said, actually, one of the fun things I found with this company is different from Compose is um, we, we're pretty, we try to be legit developer focused, uh, but mm-hmm. it's it's pretty, it's actually pretty fun to go into larger companies because we tend to go, we end up talking to like, uh, an engineering director or VP of engineering because they have this big metric they want to improve and we're helping them do that. And then we get paraded in front of the devs and actually it's really interesting to be legitimate developers and be in that position because they're so used to like Joe Random Vendor getting shown around that they don't really buy the value of that when we can actually have good discussions with them, it, it pays off in spades. Uh, so one of the fascinating things I've learned here is that like, I really like the bottom up developer sales model and I think it's a really great way to build a product, but it also is a really great way to go sell bigger deals to people because you, you get that instant legitimacy as soon as you get through the management layer to the people that are actually going to use the tool. Um, and not a lot of tools get that. There's a lot of things that have been inflicted on people at large companies that they would prefer not to use. Yeah, that's true. But yeah, anyway, developer marketing is a fun fun problem it is but i i I still just go back to that you know if if you can show them the benefit right and not try and bs people i mean that's just kind of how we are it is you know one thing i've seen i uh i keep so we we do okay with content we do pretty well with content and compose one of the and um so i've had a few people ask like how they should do content for their thing and what's so fascinating is how how bad devs are promoting their own stuff. So you'll get this person that writes this amazing tool, writes a really good article about why it's useful, and then wonders why no one ever reads it because it seems distasteful for them to like go post on a Reddit or do the mm-hmm. other things that actually promote the thing. Um, it's just an interesting. I wish I wish we were all better at promoting our work and not feeling so sketchy about it. Process at that point. So I feel like I'm quasi autistic in the way that I communicate sometimes. In fact, people have mistaken me for being autistic a few times. In fact, I'm not entirely sure that I'm not, but I don't think I am. <laughs> anyway, so sometimes I try to like market something that I'm creating and I'm just very like actual, punchy, like point, point, point about it and not very really touchy feely. And so I tried posting something on like uh, a Reddit or one of those, and then I get like lots of blowback, and I'm like, no, actually, I am one of you. I just don't know how to communicate in the way that you want. Right. I have something that I actually think is really useful. Yeah, um, yeah, <laughs> and I think, like, I actually think that's probably why everyone's really adverse to to promoting their own work because um, you flip from building something to promoting it, and there's a lot. You have a lot less it's a lot more risky. Like you're going to go try a hundred things and 53 of them aren't going to work. And you hope one of the other ones is, is worthwhile. And I, we're, we're so used to like building stuff and knowing definitively if it did its thing or not, that I think mm-hmm. a lot of us are really hung up on 
on that uncertainty. And so like when I post on Reddit or whatever, I get blowback is like, I think that's some of that is like, just, I don't know. I feel like you just have to ignore it sometimes because it will happen. And in fact, like I've posted and built stuff that's just like downright embarrassing for me now. I don't not like embarrassing in a, in a, I can't ever run for president way, but like, I'm like, ah, eh, that actually wasn't that, that useful. I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking when I did that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's a little bit not intuitive to keep kind of going back there after getting burned. It's a little bit like selling, like you get told no, and you probably do this with sponsorships. It's just like, you're going to get told no by 20 people and maybe he's by like two and you just have to, it's, it sucks, but mm-hmm. it doesn't, It just has to be done. So how are you hosting this? Do you just have a bunch of servers and a bunch of different data centers or? We do. Um, we have, we have, so every data center has at least two servers in it. Um, and then we do some nerdy internet routing stuff. Uh, it's called Anycast. And basically the idea is what you can do is you can specify routes that the global routers accept that say, when I receive a connection to this IP address, send it to the server that has the least number of hop, like hops between me and it, which is a reasonably good stand in for physical distance. Mm-hmm. Um, which is, is actually, a, that's uh, going back to what developers actually pay for. That's really difficult to replicate. And it's a thing that nobody actually wants to spend time running. Um, and so it's a, that was a relatively valuable component of the service, I think, is like you could, you could actually go turn servers on and imagine you want to pay for six data centers, but routing traffic to those is, is incredibly difficult. So just don't bother. It's not really worth your time. Makes sense. Anything else you want to ask, AJ? I'm kind of... Out of question. I think I would love to have more of a conversation, but I don't have anything that's specific to uh, the topics at hand. I'll just get us more on tangents. Awesome. <laughs> so, Kurt, um, if people want to keep tabs on what's going on with Fly or with you, um, I'm assuming you're on Twitter and probably GitHub. Um, yeah. I mean, you have a blog or anything else. Yeah. I'm Mr. Kurt on Twitter, M-R-K-U-R-T on Twitter and GitHub because I signed up early enough to get six letter names and um, <laughs> everything else. Like all of my time is spent on fly. So fly.io, if you, if you put your email in, we'll send you a, um, a, an update on Fridays until you tell us not to. Um, and we also on Twitter, I think it's literally spelled out fly.io because we signed up for that way too late on Twitter and can't get a good one. Gotcha. All right. Well, um, can I ask about pricing? Yeah, you can. Um, we are, you basically pay sort of like you pay Lambda for Lambda. You pay per millisecond of, of application execution time and then for bandwidth and then for cache storage. Uh, and th- they're all pretty competitive, but for the most part, most apps spend way more on bandwidth than anything else. Right. And our pricing is, like I said, I don't like to have to call someone to pay for stuff. So it's literally like, on the pricing page, you can see everything I just said and sign up or not. That's the, it's very, very much there for people to look at. Right. That makes sense. All right. Well, let's, let's go ahead and get to picks. Deploy more, pay less with DigitalOcean, the simplest all-in-one cloud computing platform for developers. Scale and run cloud applications faster and more efficiently with effortless administration tools to robust compute flexible configurations, networking services, real-time alerts, and rapid provisioning while enjoying industry-leading price to performance with a flat pricing structure across all global data center regions at any usage volume. Spend more time building better web apps and less time worrying about managing infrastructure with DigitalOcean. Build your next app on DigitalOcean. Get started with a free $100 credit at do.co slash jabber. AJ, do you want to start us off with picks? So I will, because the conversation of you know Microsoft buying GitHub and all that comes up, and some people are in the exodus, which I actually think that it's... Well, we'll see. We'll see. I'm not necessarily pleased with how Skype has turned out, but I would like the culture around GitHub to have more of a Microsoft mentality of being more professional and less political. It seems like GitHub... Anyway. But... I really, really like Gitty. I think it is an excellent Git platform. It is so easy to use and set up. It is very familiar if you use GitHub. It's super lightweight. You can run it on a Raspberry Pi, and that's because it's written in Go. So it's not like it's lacking features. It's very full-featured. I mean, I I don't think I've run into too much that I'm like, oh, I wish it had this, and it doesn't yet. 
Um, it's actively developed. Um, and so if you are going to, you know, part of the mass exodus or whatever, um, I would highly recommend checking out Gati because it is just so wonderful. And I want to talk about a couple of the benefits of like what I think is great about having your own self-hosted Git platform. You can run Google Analytics, so you can see like who's looking at your readme's, how often, um, how long are people looking at like which section of your documentation that's on your project page, which projects are most popular, like all of these things that have been hidden from you can come into light and you can get like real good metrics. And you might say, oh, well, if I leave GitHub, then, you know, I won't get as many stars. And that's true because you won't get as many like fly by people just clicking the button because they're like, oh, that's cool. But what you do get is a more dedicated community, like people that actually care enough to click sign in with GitHub. Okay. Okay. You know, like, so you're getting a more dedicated um, community and you have access to them because you're getting your, their email address. So if you need to reach out to the people that are using your code, then you can. So I just think that it is so great to have more of a local, um, you know, uh, your, your own personal community and culture around your projects and your code. So I highly encourage checking something like that out. And I'd also say that I really love Black Panther. Um, I thought it was very different and very interesting. Like it, it just, Something about the style of the movie was not your typical slash and blow things up Marvel movie. And I'm not, I can't quite identify it, but something was good there. Awesome. I'm going to jump in with some picks too. I mean, we're talking about the, the Microsoft and uh, GitHub acquisition. And we could have a whole nother show on it. Um, <laughs> in fact, uh, Elixir Mix, at the end of the show, it got brought up. And I finally just said, Okay, we're ending the show here and we will, you know, somebody will have a conversation about it somewhere else. Um, but yeah, I, I've heard, I've seen a lot of people leaving. Honestly, um, you know, my take, I'll just throw it out there, is that, um, you know, Microsoft has shown that they are invested in open source at this point. Um, that's not to say that they're necessarily going to do a great job or a terrible job with GitHub. I think that remains to be seen. So ultimately, I mean, I just, I'm, I'm totally open to giving them a chance. Of course, that said, I have my own self-hosted GitLab um, and it runs really nicely for me on a reasonably priced um, DigitalOcean server. And so if you're, if you're looking for a good way to go, um, I, I don't see how you can go wrong with either Git-T. I haven't played with Git-T. I need to dive into that and see what there is. But it's GitLab, so GitLab is so nice uh, for me um, and it, it does pretty much everything that, that GitHub does that I that I needed. So um, I've been pretty happy with it as far as the setup and everything else goes. It was pretty easy. So can, can yeah. I tangent you to bother asking why you've switched to GitLab? Um, it was partially because I was tired of paying through the nose for private repos and partially because I just wanted my own place that I controlled and I'm weird that way and I know it. Um, well, you know, I don't think that's weird because that's, you know, my whole thing I'm doing. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you've been working on stuff that way for a while, but there was a lot of that that was going on there too. So um, I moved all of my private repos over to, um, to GitLab and uh, yeah. Anyway, so, so that's kind of the way that that is. I've left some of my open source on GitHub, um, mainly because people are just used to finding it there. Um, but I have thought about moving a lot of that stuff over to GitLab as well. Um, and then if people want to contribute to those, then they can just get an account on my GitLab community, community edition server. Um, and that has login with GitHub as well, right? I don't remember. I, I think it does. Like with either platform, it's, it's like, it's very minimal friction. It's like two extra button clicks yep. for someone to log in. Yep. But anyway, so it's been pretty interesting to watch. Um, I guess over the last 24 hours or so, um, GitLab, like the hosted service, has gotten 10 times the upload traffic that it normally gets. So people are moving. But yeah, it'll be interesting to see where we wind up. So yeah, I, I wouldn't panic yet. And if they do, you know, if they don't maintain it the way you want or they do stuff with it you don't like, I'm guessing there's still going to be plenty of time to move your stuff off. So. <laughs> And just, I, just, I just wouldn't panic yet is what I'm telling people. 
on, on for the record, like I don't think that people should panic by any means. I I actually am pleased that Microsoft is acquiring it rather than Google. Like I think that Microsoft just has a more professional way of handling business. Um, so I'm I'm actually pleased. I like the direction that Microsoft's been heading the last couple of years. So I don't want anybody to get confused by my. I just think that you should have your own private Git platform because there's so many benefits and it's so easy to do. That's fair. One other thing that I do like about people leaving GitHub is that I think too much mindshare has been put into GitHub. And I like the idea of these platforms competing for mindshare and putting out um, better features. So Exactly. Getting some diversity in there. Yep. So, Because then it becomes about the Git repository instead of, well, what else can I cram onto GitHub? So, Anyway, Kurt, uh, I did. some picks for us. I do, uh, but I did see a tweet yesterday that said something about it. it seems like everyone's really upset about who's controlling their decentralized protocol. <laughs> it's just, <I> that was <laughs> That's like, awesome. It's just Git. Like, yes, it's not true. I mean, like, there's so many issues and other stuff in there that you can't extract, but it's kind of funny. Like, Git's super portable. Uh, I've, I've accidentally deleted my GitHub repository and had to go fix it. It's cool. Um, I have, let me think here. I have, I have a couple. Um, one of them is... There's a, so we mentioned, you mentioned DigitalOcean, we've talked about AWS. Uh, there's a company called Packet.net that does instantly provisioned physical servers that I think is actually pretty awesome. Um, so if you if you are a server geek, I would check out Packet.net. I think it's 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 very cool. They um, We do a lot of stuff on top of them and it's, it's a really kind of amazing amount of service from such a small company. And I'm a big fan of small companies. My biggest angst with GitHub getting bought is just there's like one less medium-sized company now. I mean, it was huge, but Get yeah. Microsoft is yeah. much bigger. <laughs> uh, and yeah. Um, and let's see, I think I, my other pick is a, uh, a sci-fi novel called The Three-Body Problem by a Chinese author whose name I'm not even going to try and say. Uh, and it was, it was really, really cool to read. Um, basically, it's a, I don't know who translated it from Chinese to English, but it was really written in Chinese translated to English, like you wouldn't know it was written in Chinese if I hadn't just told you. But like the the perspective and the stories is so different from anything I've ever read before, just because it was such a different type of author than anything I'd ever read before. I think it's really, really worth checking out if you like sci-fi. Nice. Um, all right. Well, I did ask you where people can find you online. Um, yep. So yeah, uh, folks, go check out Fly, fly.io, right? Online? That's it. Yes. And, uh, yeah. Download we'll it, run it. Let us know what you think. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap this one up. Uh, thanks again, Kurt, for coming. Yep. Thank you very much. All right. We'll catch everybody next week. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C A C H E F L Y dot com to learn more.